you know, we cover quite a bit. And of course, in the back of my mind, I've got quotes from, from Jack Herer floating around in my mind about the long-term sustainability of this crop and, and these segments, of course. But between cannabinoids, fiber, and, and the grain and oil side, uh, we cover it all. That's Eric Sandy, digital editor at Hemp Grower Magazine. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and today we'll listen to my conversation with Eric Sandy from Hemp Grower. We'll talk about the magazine, what they cover, and how they strive to help farmers navigate this new world of hemp. But first, we'll have a few nuggets of hemp news, and we're also going to announce the winner of our Canvas Supply Company giveaway. But first, a couple of messages from our sponsors, Kings Agri-Seeds and IND Hemp. Farming is local, and so is King's Agri-Seeds. They've been screening products for local adaptation since 1993. Using the research farm in Christiana, Pennsylvania, King's is working to ensure seed varieties are fit for the yeast. Hemp is no different. Whether you are growing for grain, fiber, or CBD, King's Agri-Seeds has got you covered. Give them a call at 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com. This episode is brought to you in part by IND Hemp. IND Hemp would like to give a shout out to their friends at WAFBA and remind you about the 7th Annual NOCO Hemp Expo, March 25th through the 27th in Denver, Colorado. IND Hemp founders Ken, Julie, and Morgan Elliott will be joined by Greg and Ben and others from the IND Hemp team, and they're looking forward to engaging with you, the people in the industry who are working together to build a farmer-focused American hemp food and hemp fiber supply chain. And while you're at the IND booth, make sure you ask for a copy of Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Okay, welcome back. So let's get into a few nuggets of hemp news. This first one comes from Hemp Grower Magazine. It says that the USDA final rule will move ahead as planned. The story is written by Teresa Bennett. And the story says that the USDA announced Monday that its final rule on hemp is moving ahead as is for implementation March 22nd. This comes after the USDA announced in late January, after President Joe Biden was sworn into office, that the final rule was under review. The story says that the final rule implements generally favorable changes for the hemp industry from the USDA's interim final rule, including an increase in the hemp sampling window, flexibility in sampling standards, and additional options for hot hemp disposal. The rule, however, retains some aspects many in the industry hope to see amended, namely the 0.3% THC limit in hemp. Changing that, however, requires an act of Congress and is out of the USDA's purview. The USDA did delay one especially contentious aspect of the final rule, the requirement that hemp testing labs will need to be registered by the DEA, which has been pushed until December 2022. Okay, here is something from Global Newswire. It says industrial hemp market worth $27.72 billion globally by 2028. It says rising awareness among the consumers about the benefits of industrial hemp, increasing legalization to cultivate industrial hemp in many countries, and rising application of industrial hemp in diverse industries such as textile, pharmaceutical, food, beverage, personal care, construction and material, furniture, and paper is expected to drive the market for industrial hemp. Yeah, is that news? I don't think that's news. I just think that's awesome. So yay, hemp industry. Okay, here's a story from the Plattsmith Journal from Nebraska. The headline reads, The Many Uses of Hemp, the Focus of Upcoming Conference. And so the gist of this article is that there is the Nebraska Hemp Conference coming up at the end of this month. It's a two-day virtual event. And I think this is great because, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking to Andrew Bish on this show and he mentioned that there's not a lot of hemp farmers out there in Nebraska. And so hopefully this conference will jumpstart things for the Cornhusker State. Go Nebraska. If you're interested in this Nebraska Hemp Summit, I will put a link to the registration page on the show page for this episode, along with all these other stories. Okay, here's one from the Austin Daily Herald out of South Dakota. Headline reads, South Dakota hemp backers hopeful about planting this year. 
The story says South Dakota hemp farmers are gearing up for the growing season while lawmakers tinker with a bill that would allow them to plant a crop this year. A key change to the original bill would permit year-round applications to grow rather than a 60-day window. Another amendment lowers the entry barrier of five outdoor acres to half an acre and allows for indoor commercial greenhouses. So, all right, South Dakota, we know it's been a struggle, but you're getting there. Here's a story from Carolina Public Press out of North Carolina. Headline reads, hemp is a hot crop, so why are so few black farmers growing it? This story was written by Jody Helmer, and it begins, Leon Moses is honest about the challenges of growing hemp. From access to land and the cost of hemp clones, to labor-intensive crop management and the lack of stable retail or wholesale markets, the process is risky and difficult. The risks are even greater for black farmers. As a result of historic discrimination that limited access to farm loans and staggering land loss that left black farmers owning just 0.5% of U.S. farmland, and triggered calls for reparations, the number of black farmers has dwindled to 48,697, or just 1.4% of all U.S. farmers. The black farmers who continue working the land could be left out of the emerging industrial hemp market, which is expected to top $26 billion by 2025. Without efforts to support black hemp growers, Moses fears that hemp will be no different than what has happened with all the other crops. We'll be leaving a group of farmers behind. Efforts are needed, he adds, to educate black farmers about hemp production and provide research and support to those who want to grow the crop to ensure that no one is left out. And again, I'll have the link to the whole story on the show page for this episode. All right, one more story here. This one is also from Hemp Grower Magazine. The headline reads, U.S. Hemp Roundtable warns against marketing psychoactive properties of Delta 8. This is written by Teresa Bennett. And it says that Delta 8 THC has made headlines lately for being a hemp derivative that can produce psychoactive effects. But U.S. Hemp Roundtable, a national industry business advocacy organization, says that's not a good thing. The organization recently released a statement against marketing products under the guise of the hemp name for any intoxicating value or euphoric effect, calling it irresponsible. While the roundtable did not explicitly name Delta 8 THC in its statement, the press release linked to two articles that detailed this so-called loophole, one in the New York Times and another in Rolling Stone. So you might remember the news nuggets from last week where I did mention that Delta 8 article in the New York Times. And we also discussed Delta 8 THC a little bit in the upcoming interview with Eric Sandy from Hemp Grower Magazine. And uh, for next week, I'm going to have a conversation with Jonathan Miller from the U.S. Hemp Roundtable about this very issue. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so I'll have links to all of these news nuggets on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. Oh, speaking of LancasterFarming.com, um, two things. The first is just last week we published a hemp special section in the newspaper, and that's up now at LancasterFarming.com. Uh, it's about a seven-page section of the newspaper. It's got hemp stories and uh, advertisements from hemp businesses, and it's a really nice thing. It came together very well. I'll have a link to that on the show page for this episode, but I think you can go to bit.ly slash hemp section and it'll take you right there. So the other thing about LancasterFarming.com, and maybe you're sometimes curious what else I do there. Like, I, do I do more than the podcast? I do. I'm the digital editor, and uh, I make stuff. And so one of the other projects I'm working on lately is a video series about a farmer here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Her name is Emma Kunif. She has a farm called Knee High Farm. It's a, you know, a CSA, community-supported agriculture operation. And just through short weekly videos, we are telling the story of her farm, you know, what it takes to run a CSA, the things she's doing week in, week out. We've got about nine episodes on the website now, and we plan to just follow her throughout the whole year. And uh, it's going to tell a really neat story. So check that out, too. Okay, so the next order of business before we get into our interview with Eric Sandy is we have to pick a winner of our Canvas Supply Company giveaway. So they were gracious enough to put together a care package that we will send out to one lucky winner. And we're doing this all on Instagram. And here, I'll just go to, uh, go to our Instagram page now here. 
Um, our handle is at LF Podcast Hemp. And let's see. La, 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 la. Okay, here it is. This is super scientific. Just kidding. All right, so our winner this week is Madison Cartwright. If you are Madison Cartwright, check your DMs on Instagram because you are the winner of the Canvas Supply Company giveaway. All right. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, who liked the post and who listens to our show. Really couldn't be doing any of this without an audience. So thank you all. Let's get into our show. Hey, Eric Sandy, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? Very well. Very glad to be here. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, so you and I have, you know, a fair amount in common. We're both named Eric. We both cover hemp uh, in the media. You are also a digital editor. I'm a digital editor, um, but you work for Hemp Grower Magazine. So I wonder if you could sort of give us a you know a short introduction. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, as you said, um, uh, I'm a digital editor at, at Hemp Grower, and this is a, a magazine that's published by GIE Media, and that's out of Valley View, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland, um, as far as uh, looking at the map. We launched Hemp Grower as a website initially in August 2019, and then uh, a bi-monthly print publication came along at the end of that year. And then just this past January in 2021, we have turned that into a monthly print publication. Oh, cool. um, okay. You know, as far as uh, GIE and the publishing company, it's, it's interesting because we've been publishing in the cannabis space uh, since about 2015. So we have Cannabis Business Times that covers uh, the state licensed cannabis cultivation market. And then uh, we have Cannabis Dispensary, which uh, is uh, a digital only title at this point. And that of course covers the state licensed uh, cannabis retail side of things. So um, shortly after the farm bill passed, of course, uh, we kicked things into high gear. We've been covering hemp for a number of years through Cannabis Business Times, but saw a really great opportunity to create a focused brand that could serve the, the emerging le legal hemp landscape uh, in the U.S. And, and internationally as well. Okay, cool. Um, and so maybe some folks listening aren't familiar with the magazine, but it's a basically a resource, sort of what the title implies. It's for hemp growers. Um, what do you cover? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely specifically for hemp growers. Uh, we also cover some of the uh, extraction and processing side of, of the various hemp market segments, uh, but it's a B2B publication. And so a lot of our articles are structured specifically to help growers um, grow their business and uh, improve their crops. And so I'm just sort of looking here at the February issue. I've got it in front of me. Uh, we've got a couple features on uh, the hemp flower market, which of course, um, you know, we've been covering on a more incremental level online. Uh, a number of states are sort of wrestling with, with the hemp flower market. I know you have recently uh, discuss this on the podcast. Uh, so we've got a longer feature on that in the magazine. Uh, we've got profiles of several hemp farmers looking back on their first year uh, in the business and some lessons that they might have drawn from that first year. Um, on the cover, we've got Jade Stefano. Uh, she runs Puffin Farms up in Washington. And so she's talking about the transition from that state licensed cannabis market into or expanding into uh, growing hemp um, okay. for CBD. And we've got an, just a number of pieces about uh, proper transplanting techniques, um, where the hemp fiber market could be going in 2021, uh, sourcing, autoflowering, CBD genetics. So again, like you said, I mean, the articles are really tailored specifically for the hemp grower to uh, expand their business, to improve what they're doing in the field or in the greenhouse or, or even on the shelves. We certainly do some of the hemp retail stuff as well. Um, and I think it's also sort of a um, in much the same way that traditional B2B magazines often are, it's kind of a, a hub in a way. I mean, I know a lot of us have, um, you know, we haven't been really doing a lot of in-person events throughout the country over the past year, um, but not only through this print magazine and through our websites and through some of our, you know, sort of webinars and virtual events, we like to act as some sort of hub where we can get growers together, talk about some of the, uh, the research that's coming out on the hemp side, um, market trends, and just as much as we can help better prepare hemp growers to, to meet the industry where it's going. Uh, as you know, and as, as your podcast illustrates really well, uh, things change pretty quickly, especially now that we're 
in uh, in the USDA's realm. Uh, you know, the regulations have have been an interesting thing to watch, and it takes a lot to just stay up to date on on all of that. So, so in the print magazine and online, we really try to make sure that we're giving growers um, actionable insights that they can take back to their field after they put the magazine away. Right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we used to call that service journalism, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Excellent. And people can sign up for newsletters and, you know, see everything for free on the website or al maybe almost everything. But um, what does getting a subscription entail? Yeah. So I would certainly direct uh, listeners to hempgrower.com. Um, you know, we have, uh, as long as you're sort of a qualified subscriber, which essentially means uh, a, a hemp grower, uh, you're, you're working in the marketplace. Um, not only is our, our three times a week newsletter free, of course, that's just an email form, uh, but the magazine itself is free too. Uh, if you're sort of part of the market, if you're a grower out there, uh, we are more than happy to send the print edition to your mailbox every month uh, for free. And um, I think that sort of, you know, it renews on an annual basis. Um, uh, and there's certainly uh, for those sort of outside of the industry, maybe uh, interested in getting in or interested in just following along. Uh, we do have there's sort of a paid model too for okay. other subscribers. Cool. That sounds like a, a great opportunity for uh, growers to to get some more information. Um, let's talk about some of the things kind of like in the industry. Um, well, so actually, first of all, let's talk about sort of the split between the cannabinoid side of things and the uh, fiber and grain side. Um, now, me personally, I I love both sides of this, but um, I think the real like promise in the future of you know sort of like um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, paradigm shifting ability is in the fiber and grain side. Um, so, how much do you cover of of both sides? Uh, you know, we cover quite a bit. And of course, in the back of my mind, I've got, uh, you know, qu uh, quotes from, from Jack Hare floating around in my mind about the long term sustainability of these, these, this crop and, and these segments, of course. But between cannabinoids, uh, CBD focused, of course, fiber and, and the grain and, and oil side, uh, we cover it all. Um, part of what we had noticed, even before Hemp Grower was launched, when we were writing as Cannabis Business Times in the hemp world, is a lot of the market interest and consumer demand in the U.S. certainly has been sort of um, gathered around uh, the CBD retail side, whether that's flour, certainly, as we mentioned, but even more so the, the topicals, the edibles, mm -hmm. uh, CBD as a nutraceutical ingredient, which of course is now sort of floating in this uh, FDA ether. Right. Um, and even at the state level, a lot of states are wrestling with CBD. Um, and we can certainly want to get into how that has evolved, but, but setting that aside for a moment, we have absolutely been leaning into coverage of the emerging fiber market in the U.S. and in, in Europe, where it's much more established. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been trying to get a lot of voices from across the Atlantic uh, on our website and in the magazine. There's a lot of fantastic research and a lot of just active businesses doing great things with, with fiber crops that I think... Uh, to some degree, are pretty easy to transplant in the U.S., or maybe I should say easier said than done, at least. <laughs> um, and on, on the grain side, um, you know, we've covered a lot of uh, growers who are um, cultivating specifically for grain for, um, again, this goes back to food products and, and cooking oils, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and all of all of which I all of which I'm talking about here. That's just sort of the tip of the iceberg, of course. Um, but to to get back to your main question, we we do touch on all those market segments and and try to give equal weight to to each of them. Uh, but like I said, there certainly has been over the last couple of years a, a surge of interest in the CBD space, which I think has led to either um, uh, oversupply certainly in the market and maybe even disappointment too on the part of many farmers who. Yeah. Um, thought that this was a, a promising opportunity and found out that it, in the specific sense of growing for CBD and trying to find a buyer, uh, well, again, that's easier said than done too. And so yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been interesting just to see that the consumer demand isn't really going away, um, but, but growers are trying to recalibrate on the cannabinoid side of the hemp market. Yeah, when I uh, was talking to 
farmers, I guess in 2019, you know, there was a lot of hype and a lot of promise. And then some farmers, especially in Lancaster County, would say, this isn't going to be one of those Jerusalem artichoke things, is it? It's like, what's that? And then you, you hear these stories that, I don't know, back in the 80s, somewhere in southeastern Pennsylvania, a lot of farmers were sold on the Jerusalem artichoke as being like the next cash crop. And so, um, I don't know, I think farmers are right to be skeptical and a little hesitant. And uh, yeah, the market does seem a little saturated right now with, with CBD. And it's yeah. like, when the farm bill came around, I think everybody was thinking sort of like fiber, but then CBD kind of snuck in and stole the show. And I think it, it works good for the industry. I mean, it sort of like has changed people's perceptions of the plant itself, you know, sort of taken away from the, the marijuana stigma. So that's good. I think so. Yeah. And, and certainly that, that stigma is a, a legitimate challenge too, in, in many, in many places across the U S in particular. Um, but it's interesting how, you know, the, the 2018 farm bill didn't exactly get signed in a vacuum. You know, it's, it's coming at a time when, uh, consumer bases around the U.S. are getting more familiar with the THC-rich state-licensed cannabis market as a as a legal market, and um, and and the the counterpart there in, in hemp, of course, is, um, is CBD products. And so, people in the consumer side are uh, finding it easier to, to learn what CBD is in the first place. Whereas I think sometimes with, with hemp fiber and, and some, and the, the universe of, of end products that you can grow for, that takes a bit more, that's a bit more of a learning curve on the demand side. And, and there's certainly more chickens and eggs, uh, that need to <laughs> fall in line on, on, on the fiber and grain side. But, but CBD has, has become sort of a, I guess to use a pun, sort of an easily digestible, uh, product concept over the last couple of years. And, and it's been on the retail side selling very well. I mean, that, that, that market just keeps growing. Right. What do you make of uh, what New York state is doing with the cannabinoid hemp program? Like what's that about you think? Well, I know uh, one of the major issues among growers and processors is certainly going back to that hemp flower um I guess dispute would be one word and, and whether hemp flower has a place in the market. Um, I, I think what's happening in New York is also not necessarily happening in a vacuum. You know, they're wrestling with um, new definitions and new concepts, much in the way that a lot of state regulators are uh, as hemp is becoming this, this more widely understood um, uh, product or concept for consumers regulators are trying to figure out what's what's okay and what's not and certainly hemp flower on the business side represents a huge opportunity and um, it's interesting how uh, even after these regulations have been drawn up then then it sort of moves over into the state legislature to try to make sure that that hemp flower uh, can can be a part of this broader cannabinoid discussion right. so I think um, you know what I've heard from uh, the processing side in New York is it's good that a lot of this is getting on paper. We're getting regulations in place. We're developing a structure and we need to have that structure. Uh, but there's a few pieces that, you know, we're going to need to do a little bit of cleaning up after the fact. And I think that, you know, whether it's on the state regulatory side, the legislative side, or even just businesses lobbying in general, it's always a, a puzzle. There's always multiple components coming together to form that structure. And rarely have, have we seen it ever just uh, happen with the snap of a finger. Um, you know, there's always a bit of a, a balancing act between business and, and the regulatory side. Sure. Um, how about Delta eight that's been in the news lately? Actually, I just read a story in the New York times about Delta eight. So I suppose Delta eight has arrived. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, I saw that piece as well. And I thought that, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, and Delta eight has been one of those, uh, interesting, um, you know, cannabinoids, when we talk about um, sort of the legal gray area that, that still sort of exists around CBD, well, with Delta-8 THC, uh, the shade of gray is, is even deeper or even mm -hmm. more complex or yeah. however you want to describe it. Um, you know, I thought the New York Times article was really good. and I, I, I recommend folks check it out because um, they brought in a few, if I recall, a few attorney voices. And, and these attorneys were essentially saying that Listen, this is a, a chemical constituent of hemp, 
assuming that we're talking about hemp here where the Delta nine remains at that, um, the 0.3% yeah, percent level or below. And, and as long as you're talking about legal hemp, then the chemical constituents are, are on the table, the fair play here. Right. Um, I, yeah, I think it's going to be one of those uh, things that's going to attract a lot more scrutiny in, in the months, uh, even in the weeks ahead. To what end? I'm not sure, though. Um, you know, we've been looking into some of the Delta-8 products that are emerging uh, f- on the retail side that, of course, can be shipped and, and sent across uh, state lines, much as any other hemp product can. Um, and it's it's a little difficult. We've been trying to sort of figure out well, where, what, where's the hemp being sourced? How how is this uh, how is this product coming to be on on store shelves? So it's something that we're actively looking into, and uh, it's hard to to really give a, a firm answer to that. Um, but it has really uh, had a, had quite a, a surge of. of visibility over the winter here. Right, right. And through my own sort of research, um, it would seem that it has, you know, psychoactive properties, much like a THC Delta 9 would have. So that's pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah, seemingly to sort of a, to a, I guess, a, a lighter extent or a lesser extent. Uh, however, uh, I wonder if people can tell that, you know, you're missing that one molecule. I don't know. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it gets pretty uh, pretty nuanced at that level, and um, nonetheless, though, I mean, we, we just had a piece uh, in in the magazine maybe a month or two ago about just uh, again going back to to flour here. The reason I bring this up is we were looking at sort of THC flour prices versus CBD flour prices, and while demand is obviously very high for both of these cannabinoids in flour form and in other forms, certainly uh, the price differences are are pretty pretty staggering. And right. so it's going to be interesting to see you might, you, there's this, you know, sort of unclear middle ground where if, if consumers are looking for a mildly intoxicating effect and they can acquire this legally under, under the, the farm bill provisions and even the way the USDA final rule has things set up, right. um, that could shake up the, the market considerably. And I think you're already seeing that effect. I mean, there are, there are retailers and, and producers uh, across the U.S. who a few months ago, even a few weeks ago, weren't really you know, pushing Delta 8 or even mentioning it at all. And now you go to some of these websites and it's, it's yeah, sort it of is, a, yeah. the featured product or whatever you want to say. It's, it's very front and center. Uh, this New York Times article, it sort of ended on a cliffhanger. You know, they're talking about how Delta 8 is about to go mainstream, but it's just the beginning because then at the very end they mention there's a Delta 10 in the works. It's a great you know, it's like a cliffhanger at the, the end. <laughs> like the sequel. Right. Um, how about um, social equity issues in the cannabis and hemp space? Do you cover that in the magazine? We do, yeah. We've been doing a lot of that sort of coverage. Again, more, more specifically on Cannabis Business Times, uh, a lot of state regulators and legislatures um, have really been leaning into that as a major component of the license application process. Right. Um, as, as listeners uh, probably know, on, on that you know, state cannabis side, uh, a lot of states, there's sort of a wave of legalization going on, of course, and that's on the medical and adult use side. And um, the license applications to get into that space have changed considerably from even as, uh, well, as recent as 2014, but also as, as far away in the distant past as, as 2014. Um, you know, uh, sustainability efforts and, and social equity have really been foregrounded in licenses. And I think... Um, you know, when it comes to the hemp side with uh, state ag departments um, looking to, to bring hemp growers into the fold for, for 2021, mm-hmm. um, that's, that's a component too. Um, you know, part of this is uh, part of the farm bill as an overarching idea, at least, you know, again, we're just talking about the hemp part of it, is uh, small business development and, and jobs creation and mm-hmm. bringing, bringing back uh, some real um, economic drivers to more rural areas in the U.S. And obviously a huge part of that is jobs. And so I think uh, more and more state regulators, now that they're starting to sort of wrap their heads around cannabis as a thing to be regulated, uh, I think they're becoming a lot more comfortable with probing business models and hiring plans, uh, 
you know, what are your ties to the local community? And I think in hemp, a lot of times you're just talking about independent farmers who, who already have those ties, um, may not be hiring hundreds and hundreds of, of people necessarily, um, but you're also seeing a lot of very large hemp businesses that are expanding and uh, developing a larger footprint all over the U.S. And I think state regulators are, are getting more interested in, in asking exactly how are you going to be improving the economy of, of whatever we're talking about here, this county or that county, um, or even this state, and, and depending on what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for if, however many years the, the war on drugs was was happening, you know, it it uh, disproportionately disenfranchised communities of color, um, you know, decimating families and, you know, all that stuff. And here, like, you've got uh, a bunch of rich white guys making money from from this legal cannabis. And so I'm really happy to see that legislators are um, are trying to right these wrongs. So... Yeah, I think I think uh, they certainly are, and it's certainly becoming more of a uh, a point of uh, contact in that application process. Um, but again, I mean, and legislators are, are doing a good job in advancing that. But I think it also really comes down to the business community, um, which again we're talking about a very young, legal, licensed business community. Um, but a lot of the stakeholders who own businesses or are maybe even trying to get into the space are very vocal about this. And I think mm -hmm. have held those legislators feet to the fire to make sure that um, this isn't just lip service. This is something that can become part of, uh, part of the economic development picture and also just part of, um, part of compliance really. If, you know, if, this is, if this industry is gonna get up and going and, and right the wrongs of the past, uh, then there needs to be some sort of uh, checkpoint to make sure mm -hmm. that's happening. And I think by and large, a lot of business owners recognize that, respect that, responsibility and um and have really embraced it too yeah good um you know getting back to like that threshold between you know hemp and thc cannabis um it seems like maybe there there should be this like middle middle spot for cannabinoid stuff where your your limits are a little different because I, I think you know that the grain and fiber stuff like the thc is completely irrelevant but then in some of those, you know, the C CBD varieties and whatnot, you know, some THC is, is good for for that stuff. So I wonder if ever we'll see sort of like a, a, a third third category develop. So just an idea. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting because while on one hand, you know, we're talking about how exciting this all is and how fast it's moving. Um, it, it, I think you raise a good point that, you know, we don't want to lock in these definitions too rigidly. Um, you know, one of the interesting things in, in the hemp world, of course, that countries all over the world are debating um, is, is that THC cap. And of course, in the US, we're talking 0.3%, uh, which, you know, we can get into some of the history there, what that's based on, which is Arbitrary. not much. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, the 1% the threshold has been thrown around a lot. Um, and not that I'm saying that's arbitrary either, but it, it more or less is. And um, I know that a lot of uh, stakeholders have come out pretty vocally in favor of, uh, of the 1% shift. And I think that gets you a little closer to, to what you're talking about, because um, not only on the, the consumer market side of things, does it become uh, a bit hard to separate THC and, and, and any other cannabinoid so strictly, but it's also it's a, that's a pretty harsh limit to stick to on the cultivation side. Um, you know, a lot of growers who have been, who have been disappointed in, in the recent years who are maybe trying to get into that CBD space in 2017, 18, 19, um, a big part of it is just finding the right genetics and, and sourcing seeds. And that, uh, that in itself is, is very complicated. And then you get into the, the rigid testing procedures later on in the season and it's those difficulties are compounded. So I think it, that to me is one of the really interesting open-ended questions and it's not even really super clear how willing the USDA is going to be to, to revisit that uh, now that we've finally arrived at uh, the final rule stage. Um, and I think, you know, how final is the final rule? Uh, <laughs> I guess we'll come to find out, but, but I think right. that's a, a super interesting question is, you know, what are the definitions of, well, there's hemp, of course, there's cannabis, which 
you know, legally means different things. I always try to add the phrase state licensed when talking about the, the other cannabis market, uh, THC rich. Uh, sometimes I use drug cannabis is another <laughs> phrase out there, but that's the thing is even just talking about it sometimes is hard. And so I think it's, um, these are things that I hope remain um, up for debate before right. they get too locked in uh, because these are complicated concepts uh, chemically, legally. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, a couple of years ago, anytime, you know, you would read about hemp, they would always say, you know, like a cousin of, of marijuana, like trying to separate, but the space in between that it's like not the same thing. But I've noticed recently that people are like, oh, no, it's the same plant. It just, you know, has sort of a different, different output. So that's yeah. nice to see because it's the same plant. It is. And, and because we cover a lot of the regulatory side of things, we end up sticking pretty close to, um, or at least following along with like daily newspapers in state capitals, mm -hmm. or even just major dailies around, around the U.S. who are trying to report on, on these developments. And especially on the hemp side, you're right, that little um, qualifying statement is, is in almost every one of these news stories. And that's not a knock on the reporters or anything. Um, I think it's, again, these are complicated concepts and cannabis as a plant or as an industry has, you know, um, wherever you fall as, as a consumer or a business owner, there's a decades long stigma attached to this. And so, um, you know, phrases like marijuana's cousin, it doesn't get you high, things like this, um, I think are digestible phrases, I guess, uh, but they do, you know, they might help the, the average layman or consumer or reader navigate things a little bit, but I, I wonder if they also muddy the waters too. Yeah, I would um, think so. Because um, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to do just sort of a, a man on the street sort of survey. And this is the, the former daily newspaper reporter thinking <laughs> out loud. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if, if a lot of folks do know that the cannabis is the plant. That's sort of the, the, the genus that we're talking about here. And hemp is more, more of a legal term more than anything. Yeah. So of all the supposed, you know, 25,000 uses of hemp, do you have a favorite or a least favorite? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think building materials are probably the, the ones that I'm thinking of most right now. Um, and I wish I, I knew more about this segment, but it is something I'm, I'm actively uh, trying to learn about and, and write about. And um, it's one of those things where I'm sort of peering over the ocean to see what's going on in Europe. Um, but not only with, with homes, but um, hemp as a substitute for like wood products, plastic products. Paper. Um, you know, it's interesting to see what it can stand in for mm. and, and how, you know, if you take a, a house as an example, I know you've had a lot of folks on your, your podcast getting into this much more than I can. Um, all the main components of a house, uh, or maybe I shouldn't overgeneralize, but many of the components of a, of a house as a, as a concept can be made with hemp. Um, and there's a lot of market infrastructure that goes into that. Again, it's uh, easier said than done, but to me, that's, that's really exciting. And, um, you know, when you talk to folks who are in the hemp space or even just aware of the hemp space, there's a lot of excitement around this. And over the next couple of years, we're going to be able to see the research and the costs, the research come into play, the costs come down uh, incrementally, and that excitement will then turn into actual demand, and that demand will start generating supply. And, and this goes back to those, uh, like you said, uh, the idea of 25,000 end uses and, and sort of a game-changing, paradigm-shifting uh, marketplace uh, with hemp products. Um, uh, the, one other thing I'll mention too is animal feed. And I think yeah. we're, we're seeing a lot more of that too. And, and that just goes back to, that's almost more of a land use thing, you know, replacing uh, a lot of the, the crops that we're growing for strictly animal livestock feed, replacing that with, with hemp products. I think that that changes the game too. And, and you're starting to see a lot more of that demand on the, um, uh, on the food side of things. I think it's sometimes easier for, for folks to wrap their heads around food rather than maybe uh, homes made out of hemp, things right. like that. But yeah, the animal feed, uh, that's going to be interesting to watch, especially again, as, as the FDA starts getting a bit more involved there. Yeah. The hemp feed coalition is doing some fantastic work there, getting the yeah. testing through and all that. 
Yeah, it's amazing to me that, you know, humans have been eating hemp and feeding hemp to animals, I don't know, for thousands of years. But then suddenly now, like, oh, nope, we're not sure it's safe. You know, I don't know, it just kind of irks me a little bit. Yeah, there was, uh, and I, I'm going to totally blank on on the Instagram account I'm thinking, but someone had just recently shared a a plant botany book from, uh, I want to say the 1700s. I wish I had this right in front of me to, yeah. to easily reference, but in this centuries old uh, agriculture book, there was a listing for cannabis and under under cannabis, uh, it, the the writing went along the lines of, you know, the cultivation of cannabis is so widely known that it's not even worth getting into. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just, you know, to your point, it's so interesting to think about the, the real history of this plant um, and, and compare it to, you know, the, the two years since the farm bill was signed and, and just realize the total gap in knowledge that unfortunately that we we're lost. left with. Yeah. yeah. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we're lucky to have a hemp historian by the name of Les Stark. And he's written a book called Hempstone Heritage. And he's, you know, he was interested in trying to figure out, you know, where hemp was grown, where it was milled and all that stuff. And uh, he spent years sort of tracing around and finding all these old mills and finding stones. But he tells this story in the book about a farmer in like 19, you know, 38 after, you know, the marijuana tax laws had gone through and all that. And this guy's a farmer in Lancaster County and he gets arrested for growing marijuana. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm just growing chicken feed, you know, like it didn't <laughs> even occur to him. That's what it was. But yeah, it's, uh, wow. it's amazing how, yeah, how that all happened. Yeah, it, it really is an amazing story. And, um, you know, I'm very, very excited to see where things go and this year and, and beyond. Um, every time I, I talk to a grower out there, there's obviously, there, you know, there's, there's mixes of some justifiable disappointment, maybe depending on the case, what, whatever happened at the end of last year, but, but by and large, a, a pretty universal excitement too. Um, especially as, as the market itself in the U S begins to really get up and running on, on some of those other segments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is such a neat space to be in. Um, and for me, a lot of it is the people, you know, it's like, I keep saying that cannabis loves community and it's true. There's just so yeah. many great people in the space working together. You know, it's, it's great. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, Eric Sandy from Hemp Grower Magazine. It's been great talking to you today. I appreciate your time. Definitely. Well, thanks so much, Eric. Great talking to you. All right. There you go. Eric Sandy from Hemp Grower Magazine. You can check them out at hempgrower.com. I'll have a link on the show page for this episode. Uh, so that pretty much does it for me and the show today. Thank you for listening. Uh, just a few reminders. Um, check out the news nuggets links on the show page for this episode at lancasterfarming.com. Also, if you happen to be Madison Cartwright, check your uh, DMs on Instagram because you're the winner of the Canvas Supply Company giveaway. Um, and be sure to check out lancasterfarming.com for our hemp special section. Oh, and before we sign off for the week, I wanted to share a voicemail I got from a listener last week after the show with the senators talking about legalized marijuana in Pennsylvania. Eric, my name is Ken Smith up here in Schuylkill County. I talked to you before. I just heard your podcast on the two uh, senators in Pennsylvania. They have no clue on how to protect the farmers to make money. There is no way a farmer is going to make money growing marijuana. Uh, they have no clue on farming and how it's go how the farmers are going to make money and put in their pocket. Absolutely no clue. It's all about money uh, because in New York, Virginia, and New Jersey, they they're just going on board with it. They they have no clue on how the farmers are going to put money in their pockets. Okay, I'm just I just thought I'd let you know about that. I'm sure other people will call. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it it is frustrating this marijuana growing, and I'm I'm so anxious to grow it, but I don't think I'm going to grow it again this year, unless I have a place. Unless I have a place to take it, that's the only way. Okay, bye. Yeah, so that's Ken from up there in Schuylkill County. Appreciate the call, Ken. 
Uh, how about the rest of you? What do you think about that interview? What do you think about their plan? Do you think uh, farmers are going to make any money on this? Yeah, we'll see. Um, I'd love to hear from you. You can always call me and leave me a message at 717-721-4462. And of course, you can always reach me by email. You can send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. So, all right. Thanks again for listening to our show. Thank you to our sponsors, Kings Agri Seeds and IND Hemp out there in Montana. Uh, my name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. And uh, until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Episode 123 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2021 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited, and produced by yours truly, Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Industrial hemp. Industrial hemp. Industrial hemp.